Okay, networking. So again, um, because of the seven-year cycle plus a mess up in retrospect in the scheduling office, um, we're missing um, two regularly scheduled classes. One is the machine building one and one is the networking one. And so we're doing those as these recitations. Um, so what I'm going to cover is um, a really important topic. And there's an uh, assignment that's related to this week that's optional but not required. Um, so I'm going to introduce networking and I'll talk about wired networks. Um, then Thras will do, um, and I'll talk about ISM radios. Thras will do Bluetooth and then Tomer will do Wi-Fi. And any of these can be examples of what you use for um, this week. Oh, are you recording from there? Um, I am, but my battery will die in about 30 minutes. So. Okay, so um, Dan turned on his laptop. Um, okay, so networking. Um, the, the optional assignment for this week, which is usually a separate week, is build a wired or wireless network connecting at least two processors. So the distinction is this week's assignment is one processor talking to a host computer. And then you're going to interface it to sensors and actuators. The point of this is for you to have two different processors talking to each other. Um, so first is why. And there's many more reasons than you might realize. So one reason to network is locality. You want to talk to a device that's somewhere else. So you know, a web page for an embedded device. Um, there's a second reason, which is uh, parallelism. So in the processor in this computer, it's running many threads. And as you go up to bigger and bigger processors, you go to operating systems that then do thread scheduling. Um, but we covered yesterday that a for tens of cents, you can get a processor with a clock cycle of tens of nanoseconds. <coughs> and you can put a process in a processor. So you can make, instead of outgrowing a small processor and going to a big processor, what you can do is you can make a system that has many small processors, each that owns one task. And what's really interesting about that is it means rather than scheduling execution of threads, you have this very fine-grained parallelism. So if you have, you're building a system, and one part has to communicate, one has to control a display, one has to talk to an interface, rather than going to a big processor and scheduling, you can put each of those tasks in a separate small processor. So, yep. Is this like how the GPU cycle grows out of the CPU? Say it again? Is that how the GPU grows out of the CPU? Uh, a, a little bit. Sure, a little bit like that. But just, just a general but way to think about, I mean, it, 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 it's parallel computing, but in embedded systems. So think about schedule, process threads you schedule being broken apart into separate processors. So parallelism is a second reason. A third reason is modularity. If you're building a big system, let's say you're making a robot that has multiple legs, you could have a big computer running the whole robot, or you could break it apart and have a little computer running each part of the robot that you can test and debug separately, and then you connect them in a network. And so modularity helps with development by decomposing the system into parts you can test separately. And then a fourth reason is interference. You might have a system that has high voltage, in part of it, high, in the robot, high current in part of it. You might have electrical noise in part of it. You might have very sensitive measurements. And so you want to physically decompose the system so that they don't interfere with each other electromagnetically, electrically. You know, you have, to have uh, separate interference in parts of the system. Um, so those are all reasons to network, only one of which is locality. So networking is much more than just talking to something far away. Um, so to start, I'm going to cover the simplest about imaginable network, but that's really surprisingly useful. So when we talked yesterday from 
the processor to the host. We were using RS-232. Um, this is an app note. RS-422 and 485 are extensions of RS-232 that are multi-drop, that let you have multiple things on one wire. And what I'm going to show you now is a really, really simple version of that. So um, here is um, here's a node talking out to the FTDI cable. And then here's a simple wired network of two other nodes. So this is three nodes in a network. And what I'm going to do with them is, if you watch this video, ooh, I should. Um, so each time it flashes, you'll see um, words appearing here. And then when it flashes, all the nodes flash once, but only one node flashes twice. OK? So you see the words node 0, node 1, node 2. And then each node is flashing first to acknowledge communication, and then second, the second flash is to acknowledge when it's being addressed. So to explain that, if we go back to, let me start with the code and then show you the construction. So this looks almost like what we did before. If you remember the serial com we did before, um, before, there was a loop where you'd wait for a character to come in and then send a character back out. Okay. So what I'm referring to is this. If we went to embedded programming, um, echo hello world. This was the thing that echoes characters. And what it does is it waits. You get a character, and then you put back a character. This is almost the same. It's just very subtly different. Here's the first flash when you get a character. Then what I do is I've hard-coded a node ID. So each node has hard-coded an identity, a character, just in this really simple trivial network. And then I say, if the character that was sent matches my ID, then here's the crucial line. Each pin on the processor can be an input or an output. What this does is, initially, I've got all the processors listening to the wire. So there's a transmit line from a computer out and a receive line into the computer. Initially, all the <coughs> processors are listening to the transmit line, and none of them is connected to the output line. What happens here is, if the character matches my ID, that processor is going to take over the communication line. Then I'm going to put out a message, and then I'm going to let go of the communication line. And so what's going on on the boards is really trivial. Here's the, um, the head node. And so this side is the FTDI, FTDI interface. And all I'm doing is I'm taking the transmit and receive lines, and I'm busing them. Here's a daughter board, and all it's doing is connecting the transmit and receive lines. And so um, what's going on here is th these headers let the cable go in one side and out the other. And so I'm sending power ground transmit and receive. So there's tr transmit and receive going from the host. Transmit goes to all the boards. They all listen to transmit. Receive goes back to the host. They're all connected to the very same receive line, but they use the fact that you can flip the pins from input <coughs> to outputs, so you only connect to the receive line when you're being talked to. So then if we go back to the video, um, when we play the video, if I... Um, these messages, node 0, node 1, node 2, from the point of view of the host computer, um, it thinks it's only talked to one device. It just sees data coming in. But each of these messages is coming from a different board. The host sends out a character to say which board to talk. That board connects 
to the line going back to the computer. It flashes its light a second time to say, you're talking to me, and it sends a message back. Okay? And so with only a few extra lines, what this does is it takes the simple serial example that you're doing this week, and it turns it into a wired network. Now you can talk to a whole string of processors through the very same, the echo hello world you're going to do this week. With almost no more than that, you can talk to many <coughs> processors instead of one by having them taking turns connect to the wire. And that's it. It's barely a network, but with almost no effort, it lets you connect multiple processors to one computer. Okay? Got it? Questions? So does the computer think that there are only three nodes it, it has no idea. It, it just thinks it's talking <coughs> to a thing. It has no idea. It's it's no, it has no idea they're taking turns talking to it. Now, what the computer is doing is, you know, it, um, it, in that example, so if we go back to the C code, um, the, the nodes talk back when they're addressed. So I'm typing commands. I'm typing which node I want to talk to. And the nodes take turn taking over the wire and talking back to the me. So from the computer's perspective, there's just a wire of information coming. But in the system, it's fanning out to the different nodes. How do the nodes know their number? It's hard coded. Each one is flashed. So this is node 0. When I flash them, I change oh. this. It, in this trivial example, it's just hard coded. And you flash them with different IDs. Okay. So this is a really trivial example, but this will take you surprisingly far. This will let you have one outside world connection shared internally by many processors. And it's enough to do a lot of what I described, make multiprocessor systems. Okay. So we're now, from now on, we're going to talk about much fancier things. But don't forget this. This is a really, really trivial, easy way to connect multiple processors together. <coughs> yeah. Just to clarify, so the, the computer is sending out to which node? It's sending out zero. So in this case, there would be, you need to do flow control, which I'll talk about. In this case, the computer is a master. This only works because the computer tells only one processor at a time can own the wire back, and this computer tells which processor has the turn to connect to the wire. Okay. So yeah, it sends out either a 0, 1, or a 2, and then that one responds back. Right. Yep. OK? So this is a simple, multi-drop wired network. Trivial to implement. It, it's just the echo with a few extra lines, but it's enough already to make a multiprocessor system. OK? So, so that, that's the beginning. Um, here's a step after that. Uh, let's see, this page, let me refresh here. Uh, I squared C, uh, Philips Electronics became NXP. I squared C is a mature standard that's a little bit fast, fancier. And so there are a lot of devices that you'll buy, like accelerometers, <coughs> that come with I squared C interface. It's an interface to talk between processors. Um, and so it does a little bit more than the example I showed you. So in I squared C, um, it has uh, two wires um, in the protocol. And it's synchronous. And the synchronous means um, when something wants to talk, there's a master and slaves. Um, the master signals I want to talk. The slave signals I'm ready to talk. Then the master signals a line to toggle data, and then the slave consumes the data. And there's a protocol for how that happens. Um, and so again, uh, dis displays, sensors, lots of different embedded devices come with I squared C interfaces. So um, here are six different ways to do it with AVRs. Um, uh, some AVRs come with a TWI module. Now, TWI is a funny legal thing. For a while, no longer, but for a while, Philips was proprietary about calling things I squared C. And there was legal shenanigans over it. So TWI is I squared C without calling it I squared C. It, it, it's just a confusing, it's the same thing with a different name to get around the legal department, but they don't worry about it at any 
anymore. But this is a note about using the TWI module as a master. This is a note about using the TWI <coughs> model as a slave. Each of these app notes comes with code. Um, some of the Atmel processors have a USI module. Yep. Uh, one of the libraries is broken. From Atmel? Yeah. Which one? Uh, I, I don't remember. I could look it up. Okay. Uh, I think that it might be the, uh, the TWI module master code. Okay. Set, send a note um, I, uh, about that. Um, USI, TWI is just TWI. USI is a more general module for serial communication that has a TWI mode. This is about using the USI module as a master. This is about using the USI module as a slave. And then these are really nice. This is, um, in my example code I showed you here, what I'm doing in these routines is I'm bit banging serial. So there's hardware modules to do serial, but the processor is so fast you can do it in software. So in, in the camp, simple example I gave you, this is a software implementation of serial. These are app notes from Atmel to do I squared C but without any hardware support, just doing it purely in software. So this is a, a software master, software slave. Um, so not using the hardware module, just simply doing software. The downside to software is the processor is busy. It can't do anything else. The hardware module frees it. The upside is you can use any pin on any processor and it's completely portable. Um, then Atmel has this, oh yeah, this is, there's an Arduino library to do um, I squared C. Um, and I should also add to this, Atmel's, the new version from Atmel is this giant bloated um, software framework library that also has an I2C implementation. So many, many different I2C implementation. So in this example here, um, this is, it looks almost the same as what I did before, but now what I'm taking is SCL and SDA are the peripherals, and if we go to um, so if we go to the data sheet for the tiny 45, what you'll see is there's the USI module, and the USI module has a TWI two-wire mode. And the two-wire mode goes out on the SDA and SCL pins. And the pins are overloaded. So if you look at our 8-pin processor, um, one of the things they can do is um, uh, SCL and SDA are functions on the pins. So what I'm doing here is I'm bringing the two lines for I squared C to the two pins on the processor. Um, that's for the head node, and then the slave node um, just breaks out those pins. And then there's one note here, which is, and so here's now a network that looks similar to the zero one I showed you, but now it's running I squared C. And there's one little catch, which is when you program it, you have to use a different cable because the pins that are used for programming are also the pins that are used for the communication. And if you use the bus cable, what will happen is one processor will try to talk back to the other processor's programmer. So this is a cable that's only bringing power and ground while you program it, other, so you don't have a war. Um, and then, then you use it as a network. Um, I, I'll add a Hello World. I didn't put a Hello World here just because you can use any of these libraries with it. I'll go back at some point and add a Hello World. But you can take these and use any of these libraries. And those let you do I squared C. I squared C doesn't really add anything over the first example I showed you for functionality. The main thing it does is it lets you talk to I squared C devices. And so, um, you know, if you go to a DigiKey and you want to buy an accelerometer, um, uh, there's a thousand accelerometers, and um, uh, the you'll, you'll see. Um, the most common interface for them is all of these have I squared C interfaces. And so now if we pick one of these, um, uh, the, um, 
so here, here's now the processor. If you want to talk to this accelerometer, you connect SCL and SVA doing I squared C to the accelerometer as a peripheral. So the, the main reason to use I squared C is if you want to talk to other I squared C devices. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and again, I squared C is multi-drop. You can have many things hanging off of a line. Again, they have hard-coded IDs. You need to burn an identity into each one. Okay. So those are two kinds of wired networks. I'm going to skip for time a lot of the other background on networking, but I'm going to cover one other um, really interesting wired network, which is if you have a device that's wired, but you want to connect it to the outside internet. Um, Brass and Tomer are going to talk about radios to do it. Um, but if you can connect to a wired connection, um, oh, in fact, let me, I, I do want, there is a link I do want to add. Let me make a reminder. Um, if you want a wired connection to the internet, one way to do it is um, WizNet. Um, No, I don't. I'm just checking to see if I did link that, and I didn't. So, um, yeah, I'll add a link to it. Um, so, uh, this is a $20 module, and what it implements is a full internet protocol stack with an Ethernet connection broken out to logical pins. And so, you talk to this just like the FTDI cable. You just send characters to and from it but it implements the whole <coughs> network stack. And so that's about a $20 part. So if you want to connect to Ethernet, that's the way to do it. It's, it's very hard to break this down finer than that. Everybody does it by buying these modules. But there's a really neat trick that's, that's forgotten, largely forgotten, which is in the early days of computing, when you connected to the Internet by a modem, you would use what's called SLIP. And SLIP in implements internet over a serial connection. So you'd make a serial connection to the modem. The modem would dial up, and then you'd get on the internet. So internet over serial is called SLIP. Every operating system still supports it, but it's forgotten since people don't use modems anymore. But what it means is you can take a serial connection, exactly like we covered this week, and you can magically turn it into an internet connection. And so... Um, here's um, some nodes, and what I'm doing right now is it's a serial connection just like we did before, but now they have internet addresses, and I'm sending packets to them, and I'm getting packets back from them. And so it's a serial connection exactly like the other examples I did, but now they're on the internet. And so they're full-fledged parts of the internet. So what's going on there is um, you have to tell your computer to turn the connection into an internet connection. And so in, it's different in different operating systems. In Linux, you use what's called slattach. And slattach is a command that says, this serial port is now part of the internet. And Windows and OS X have equivalents to turn the serial port into an internet connection. And then in the C code here, what I'm doing is a very simple but complete um, internet stack. So what I'm doing here is this is forming an internet packet. And then I'm forming the packet um, and sending and receiving the packet. Um, <coughs> and what that does is let you take a physical serial connection if you already have a computer you can plug into and share that computer's internet connection and make your wired device part of the internet. Okay? So largely forgotten, but it's a great way to turn wired connections into internet connections. Okay, so that's slip. Um, any questions so far? Yeah? Why would you want to do that? If you have to plug it, if you have to plug it into the PC to begin with, why bother with microprocessor in this case? Um, but 
if all you're doing is computing, but you might be controlling motors or lights or displays or sounds, it's you know it's it's peripheral. If it if it's something that's not in the PC, right? If if let let you know if you had a computer doing a job, but you wanted it to um, switch a relay, you you could have it, it. It's a question about where the state resides, and it let 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 lets you have the state reside. Um, you know, another example is the um, uh, the WizNet module is twenty dollars. Uh, a Raspberry Pi is thirty dollars. Um, and if you want to go from the Raspberry Pi out to embedded devices, you could just do GPIO, or you could use the Pi as an Ethernet interface, and then you could bridge it, and then you could have a whole wired IP network where you can address all the nodes on the network separately. Okay, so those are wired connections. Um, now we're going to do radios. Um, Radio design is surprisingly interesting. Um, in the class I'm going to be doing this spring, um, I'm going to cover what are radios. How, how, how do antennas work? How do waves travel? How, how, how do you, what is the ether as a medium? The, the physics of all of that. Um, Uh, what's great is within just the last few years, radios have gotten much simpler to work with. They've been commoditized in modules. So at the furthest extreme, um, these are really fun parts, um, dollar and quantity. Um, this is a trivial 8-pin transmitter. You, you connect just a inductor you, uh, and capacitor to it, and it becomes a transmitter. And um, this part is a receiver. And um, again, you just conduct it, connect an inductor and a capacitor to it. And these are what are used in things like garage door openers, or keyless remotes for cars, or servo toys, things like that. It's like a you know, one dollar radio that just send, it, it acts like a, a slow wire that sends commands through it. And so think about like a remote control, a simple remote control, and that's what these get used for. Um, these are running in what are called um, ISM bands. And so uh, the FCC in the US and the equivalents around the world have carved up um, the spectrum. And um, see, this is a good, um, there's this, in each decade, there's an ISM band. So there's a very important one at 2.4 gigahertz that was originally, this was here for microwave ovens. It's originally a trash band that's been taken over by Wi-Fi. There's one at 5 gigahertz, there's one at 900, but there's one in each decade in frequency. There's one at 24, um, there's one around 300. There's a series of bands, and the bands are basically open season. You can do whatever you want with them. And so these run in a very low frequency, uncluttered band, Really cheap, simple radios. These are great if you just want to have like a button do a command. That's all you need. Um, this is a um, neat part that's a amazing single chip radio. And so, in this is about a two or three dollar part. But what's in this is incredible. Inside that chip is a oscillator, a phase lock loop to do frequency synthesis, a power amplifier, a transmit receive switcher, a low noise amplifier, mixers, uh, demodulators, bit slicers, you know, a whole RF system. Everything you need to make a full radio um, in this $2 part. And so from there, you can, with that part, you can, um, this is a board you, you can make in the lab. This is a fab labable. That's been largely replaced, though, by you can, um, they now sell modules. For just a couple dollars more, you can buy that chip in a pre-made module. And what's neat about, if we go back to the data chip, data sheet, is um, this goes from, um, yeah, so from, 
This runs across the 400 megahertz band, 800, 900 megahertz. You can place this um, very broadly in the hundreds of megahertz up to gigahertz part of the spectrum, wherever there's frequent, you know, uh, convenient places to talk. So it's a very agile, very broadband radio in a cheap module. And when you're all done, it acts like a serial connection. Data goes in one side and off the other. Um, more recently, these have become very popular. These are Nordic radio chips. And um, this PCB design is very fussy. Um, to make, uh, here, if we go, sorry, go, let's go back to this one. To make something like this, um, this part of the design is very sensitive to, to get the matching to the uh, radio. Um, these, uh, let's see, you can either get these with external antennas or with built-in antennas. Um, that last one I showed you was at 900 megahertz. This is 2.4 gigahertz. And these have come way down in cost. So this now has $6 for a pair of them. It has an integrated antenna. It has the RF matching network, the little fiddly bit of the circuit to make. Um, it acts like a serial connection. Data goes in and out the other. It's a transceiver that goes in both direction. Really easy to talk to and surprisingly capable. In free space, line of sight, you can talk about a kilometer with these. Won't go through walls, but line of sight can be about a kilometer with it. Um, <coughs> And these are well supported by libraries, including uh, our, there's Arduino libraries for talking to them. And so unlike the remote control, what these let you now do is do reasonable data rates. So you, this is like old modem dial-up speeds. Depending on the connection, you can go from tens to hundreds of kilobits a second. Um, but this now lets you send data between things. So if you want to have like a fancy remote that can send lots of different commands, not just on off, one of these lets you send messages between two things. And so compared to what we're about to talk about, you shouldn't jump immediately to Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Those are going through very cluttered parts of the spectrum with very particular protocols. If you have two parts of a system and the goal of the radio is non-locality, you want to beam stuff through the air, um, these ISM modules are a great way to do that. I post a tutorial for NRF24 on a tutorial session. Oh, good for you. So. Um, what explain this project? Uh, so this project was for uh, part of my final project. So I made a uh, board that uh, with what well, that would the pin would handle the ISP and also the uh, NRF twenty board. So the idea is to uh, I break it down so that one board just sent, just does sending, one board just does receiving, and the example goes to like how I delete the code to make that happen. And oh, this how, is great. How I um, now start with the uh, simplest example, which is pinging. You would type in T for trans to make that board transmit. You would type in R to make that board receiving. And this is a trick that I did where you can have uh, two FDDI cable plug into your machine and just duplicate your uh, Arduino software and open both of them. And you can get uh, serial data from both uh, chip. And um, that's... That's uh, that's uh, what's doing in action, um, <coughs> and I use a wind sensor to blow on it, and then sending that data to the servo, and it moves like a piece of leaf. Uh, it's like uh -huh. down the end. It's like super simple to use. Uh -huh. So you can have that like outside. And, I'm just attaching a uh, light sensor and uh, just covering up. <laughs> and uh, this, the, um, the spec sheet says it takes three votes, but five votes, okay? <laughs> it didn't burn it, uh, it still works. Okay. <laughs> so. Not recommended, but okay. Uh -huh. Good, uh, Dan, this is great documentation. So again, if you want to send messages wirelessly, and that's all you want to do, this is a great way to do it. Oh, this part is a little weird. Uh, well, it's not weird, but um, I... So a lot of pins uh, for this chip also uh, is ISP, ISP uh, pins. So I just rewire it so that it, it serves as a dock for this chip and also serves as an ISP pin as well. 
Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, the when you program with your programmer, you're using the ISP protocol. The programmer uses ISP, so you have an ISP interface already on the board. That's what that's what it does. Yeah. Okay. So those are the NRFs. And now, finally, what we're going to cover is two really important parts for a lot of your applications. Uh, so first, Thras will go with Bluetooth, and then Tamer for Wi-Fi. So Thras, you want to use this computer or this? Uh, I can use this. Okay. Go ahead. I'll use one of the then. Actually, I had a video. So I put in the tutorial section. So, okay, I'm gonna talk about Bluetooth, and in particular this very nice module. So, <coughs> at first, we have, so until now we're using the Bluetooth module 8C05, which was implementing a Bluetooth 2.0 protocol, protocol, which is like the most commonly used protocol uh, among all of them. I have put a link here, actually. I have a resources section here, which I put a link that says the difference between Bluetooth versions are practically Bluetooth 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are all for different purposes. And the Bluetooth 2 is the most common, which is happily used among all devices, apart from Apple devices, which now they have uh, a consortium of manufacturers which, which can be, uh, manufacture Bluetooth devices with specific specs for iPhone, which is called the MFI, and you have to pay an amount of money to be in that list. So, it's, so everybody, everybody has stopped using Bluetooth 2.0 and is using Bluetooth 4.0, which Bluetooth 4.0 main purpose was low energy. So with the practically the difference between Bluetooth 1, 2, and 3 was data rates. You could get, I mean, there were updates so it would get uh, higher bandwidth so you could transmit more data. Bluetooth 4 is in the opposite, opposite end of the spectrum, so you transmit low data but with very low power. So you can be practically running a Bluetooth, for example, uh, the Jawbone app, which is like a small clock that you have in, in your, on your hand, uses Bluetooth uh, 4.0 and can last for like six months with just battery because it just sends uh, very long, I mean, small size packets and at intervals when, I mean, it doesn't transmit continuously, it just sends only thousand percent. So it, it has their uses. So I made this tutorial with Bluetooth 4.0 because you can use it actually uh, as both. You can use it as a full-fledged Bluetooth 2.0 uh, module with just the, the, the limit on the data you can send is one, uh, what is it? one mega byte per second. Anyway, you can set, sorry, 20 byte packet per second. So, with 20 bytes, you can have, yeah, 1 million different messages. Uh, so, <coughs> but you can also use it with iPhone. So, that's cool about the 8 and 10. There are various modules that you can use uh, to do, to do BLE4. Uh, in the, like, 043 area, I have two of them. I have BLE Giga. Uh, one on two, one on twelve is this module. Uh, complete giga. Which is a really fancy module. They have they have written a library uh, from Blue Giga, and you can practically like off the shelf do uh, use it to do almost everything you, you ever want. So it can be used as an eye beacon. It can be used as a uh, master or slave module. It, it has also uh, what was the? They have a, this, this proprietary Bluetooth Smart protocol that Blue Giga is using that you can, I mean, auto automate more stuff. But about fifteen dollars. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So the cost is fifteen dollars. I can. I found it actually from China for like ten dollars. But again, you never know. And then, but you can do everything that does the BLE one hundred twelve. You can do it with the HM ten, which practically has the same chip. CC2540 from TI, which is the other thing. Okay, never mind. So, 
I didn't hear a small passage about uh, uh, about like what's important, why belief four is like useful, and most of it is because you require low low energy. So you can practically have this module with 3.3 volt battery and then a small microprocessor is like tiny, and then you can you can like send wirelessly data from a part of an experiment or for example you use you can use it as an iBeacon and then attach your keys and then it continuously transmits its posi its position so you can have a proximity sensor. So I have to relate this to what we talked about uh, conventionally Bluetooth isn't a network. It's 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 a big kind of oversight. It um, it's just a wire, but without the wire. So there's a master, and then you, you're connecting peripherals to the master. Uh, uh, unlike what, what Tamara was talking about. Exactly. So it has so it has really four is four modes you can use. It's it has the master and slave mode. Master is practically the one who initiates the connection, and slave is the one who accepts the connection. And it has also the advertising and scanning mode. So. In, when you are in advertising mode, you practically send out your name and say like, "Hey, I'm here," and it's what's called discoverable mode, in like most interfaces. When you are in scanner mode, it's like when you open your Bluetooth and you press scan, so it scans for other devices. And then there are some like intermediate modes which practically lead to being either master or slave. So um, this is a module <coughs> by itself. There are four, uh, like. Rather modules of this one, uh, which are the HM10, 11, and 12 actually. So it's the whole, uh, by the way, it's a Chinese company also, this is a Google translated uh, data set. So it's really bad. I parsed most of it into the tutorial, but yeah, I mean, there are some still some things here I cannot understand. So here is the whole spectrum of HM devices they are giving you. So from 1 and up until 9, they're using Bluetooth 2.0 protocol. And then HM10 <coughs> is the one we have here. And HM11 is a Bluetooth 4.0. We have actually four HM11s downstairs. It's, it's the same module, the same everything apart from the form factor. So it's a bit smaller so that it can fit. Um, I mean, it, I think it can fit exactly on top of the C, how to call the, this 3.3-volt uh, battery, 3.7-volt battery. And then here is a breakout of the board. For the class here, I ordered already uh, broken out eight and tens. So you have, if you go downstairs, you can find, or actually here, you can find a, a bunch of those. This is the eight and module. It has a 3.3 volt regulator, so you can plug directly a, like a TTL cable. Then again, as with most of the modules, they say that they work at 3.3 volt in TTL, so for the logic, but I'm using a 5 volt cable. And it's happy. And I actually found some tutorials that because you're, I mean, you can use a 5 volt like, processor to talk to them because you're talking, like, if you're talking once per one hour or you're sending a small amount of data, then they practically don't. And then just if you go up, so that board breaks it out with the pins, but it's really easy to connect to these. You just you, it's just a serial interface, and so you just make a LAN pattern and you solder to that to paste it into whatever exactly. else you're doing. Yeah, so in the fab library, which I have to find where it is and upload it, I have... So it's in the doc archive. Okay, so I upload it. I made a breakout board for... So sorry, and just over here. Um, if you go to... Um, a CD, it, CD, fab, CD... Classes eight six three fifteen. Then we have the doc repo, and then we have tutorials, and then we have electronics design, and then there's fab.lpr. Oh, okay. So I'll update. So I, I included a breakout um, symbol and package for Great. some ten eleven super and one for these. So this practically it, it has. You can use the FTDI header um, symbol to do it, but be very careful because the pinout is not the same. So I have written here, I, I'm showing here like the pinout. So they put VCC and ground together and then TXT or X. So if you want to connect to an FTDI header, um, like the symbol, make sure 
of the, the, the connections, but actually made a new part that will be included in the hub LDR. And then I'm starting here to parse like important points in the data sheet, but the, the most important thing you should know about this device is how you talk to it. You program it to be in, to, 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 to be in the same <coughs> mode or to, uh, or to program its settings, and it's through 80 commands, which is the same as the ESP8286. And again, this dates back to the ancient days of modems. There was a standard Hayes command set you used to yeah. talk to modems, and it's lived on in these modules. Yeah, I put, I put a link for it. It's really interesting, actually. I just read it last day. It's really interesting how uh, the commands work. So, okay, here I, I made a list of like 16, 15 out of the most useful most useful commands you, you will ever use. So it <coughs> drops the name of the device, the baud rate. They actually say that don't like measure a lot with the baud rate because it's, it's a bit fuzzy. And then to set the mode, um, set passwords, reset. Um, there is a slight difference between the 18 10 and 18 11, which I, so there are two, two, mo two uh, 80 commands, 80 mode and 80 role. So both of them say that it, so the one says set module working mode, the other says set the master slave mode. With eight and 10, both of them work. So I'm not sure what's the difference. Maybe one. So the firmware is pretty stable for the past one year, but if they have updated, upgraded, one of those might be duplicated. So just look for that. So these modules are rapidly changing. It's roughly once a year, they're all completely different. It's exactly, and there's a very nice guide here. Which, uh, the guy practically spent a lot of time, like two months, experimenting with this device. And then he made a really nice extractable, which also is an extractable of writing your own uh, firmware for the device. So <coughs> this is not open, the firmware is not open source, but you can actually start writing an open source firmware and practically do whatever you want. It's like getting the CC2540 chip directly into the, in your board. And then, I, yeah, I've done two tutorials. The one is not up there yet, it will be tonight. Do the demo. The demo, I actually could do it right here. But. So now I just connect the module with the FTDI cable to my laptop, and I open a serial terminal. So it's practically the role of the eight tiny we, we use. And then I have an application on my phone. I actually put here similar applications for iPhone, Mac, Android, and Windows Phone, which what practically does it allows me, you connect to a BLE 4.0 device and allows me to send uh, and receive strings directly. So the break, the, the module that we have, I mean the whole breakout, performs transparent RXDX with the Bluetooth. So we practically, you can write a string, it will go directly to the Bluetooth uh, RX, and then whatever response comes back, it will go directly to the TX. And the, the, the only difference between the programming and sending data is that if you send something that starts with 80, it will be a command. I mean, I'm not, so I'm not actually certain how it distinguishes the command in the beginning, because if you send a command, if, sorry, if you send a string, then it goes directly to a connection mode. So if you're connected to the device, it will just send the string. If you're not connected to the device, it will just do nothing. If you send an 80 command, it comes to a programming mode. But for some reason, the application that I downloaded before the iPhone, it doesn't stop the connection. So, so I was sending, in the video, I'm sending, actually not in the video. I was sending 80 commands while it was connected to my phone through Bluetooth. So I, I'm not sure if the, application has a buffer or like a, a cache that stores the details. So you can use like whatever serial monitor you want in the laptop, full term or Arduino serial monitor or command line. And then I'm sending now hello from the laptop and then I can receive it on the phone. And again, the laptop already has Bluetooth. The whole point of this is the laptop is emulating your project. The exactly. laptop is doing so what the AVR does. This is what I literally didn't have time to do it, but it's very easy. You can just try it. So this is to of Neil's board. 
this is the uh, RxDx communication, that, like the first bus, I think it's called the bus uh, .c. And this is the uh, one of the input devices, <coughs> input device boards is, is the proximity sensor, actually the capacitance sensor. So what you can practically do is, <coughs> after you program it, instead of connecting it with FTDI cable to your computer, you just connect this port and then communicate one each other. So you can sense, I will, what I will make actually, it's, a, it's when you sense sensing capacitance here, so when I put my, my hand on it, I will turn on a LED on this board. Right. So and again, if that's all you want to do, I would use the ISM radios to get rid of all the protocol. Um, the, the main app for this is uh, phones, is uh, yeah, interfacing exactly. the mobile so, devices. So what I just described you, you know, one of the cool products I have here is uh, it's like very easy to do with your iPhone. So practically, if I made if I make the board here, uh, on, the board only on the left, and then instead of the right part, I use <coughs> my phone and I send through the light application a command, then I can like, speak to the processor and do it. Whatever I want. So, yeah. What else? There's a, there are the Xcode Blues developer tools if you want to make an application for the iPhone. And there is a guy, uh, a guy who made a guy. There's a guy uh, for the application. Some of the links here. Okay. So Welcome. something you could do with this for this week is, you know, I gave the Hello World that's a serial echo. You could do a Bluetooth serial echo. So you type a character, it goes to the module, the module goes to your board, and then the board turns it around and sends a message back would be a good exercise. And then the, the, and the last note, one of the very cool things you can do with BLD4 is this, pro, is this Apple patented notion of iBeacons, which is, they, they act as like proximity sensors for things you want to know where they are. So for example, if you're here and then you have your keys and you want to live with, with your keys, then you can put one of those uh, devices and set it in iBeacon mode, which what it does practically is it's, actually I don't know if it, it just transmits a random thing and then you care only about the strength of the signal. So you can find out how far away you are from your item depending on the strength of the signal of the Bluetooth. So there are both there are applications like this you can develop very easily. There is actually the guide, the guide here, so that you can make your own icon. So you can take one of these devices, like stick it to your keys, and then make this application on your iPhone, and then you can practically know how far it is. Okay, questions? <coughs> okay. Are yep. any of those modules in the architecture shop? So I'm not the, sure. If they're not, they should be. All of these come in a day or two. Um, all of the shops should have them. Uh, go back and check. I'll send a note, but um, uh, Dan was just nominated ISM guru. <laughs> um, Fras will be a Bluetooth guru, and Tomer will be a Wi-Fi guru. Um, and if they're not in your shops, um, they can be ordered and come in a day or two. I have many here. Okay, in fact, yeah, maybe what we should do is just uh, I mean, check with each of the shops. Check with the gurus responsible for each shop this week and scatter them around. Okay, so that's Bluetooth. Okay, Tamara. Yep. Oh, look at my yeah. HDMI? HDMI. Resolution again? No, it goes much higher. It, uh, it does 1080p. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, ESP8266, I apologize in advance. This is uh, a Google Doc, which will, uh, that you have a link to in the tutorial section, but it will soon become a, a proper part of the website. Um, so ESP8266 is, is kind of like this uh, 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 this unicorn, right? It's like it's like a, a, an amazing promise. There's a lot of emotion that it stirs in. Or a lot of you could also call it a sausage. In some way. A sausage <laughs> of like 
you sweep up like a lot of stuff and put it in in a case. Uh, Espressif. So the, um, this is thanks to the ferment of Shenzhen. It's this crazy part that integrates a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't integrated in a really interesting but unstable way that's rapidly changing and not quite documented. Yeah. And so, so it's 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 very exciting because it, it has like this amazing promise of, of being like the chip that does everything. Um, and then you become, uh, you know, like you, you, you learn to, you know, hate it because of some of its faults and then you hate it and then you love it again. So it's like this very emotional thing for everyone who used it. Yeah. Um, so I hope... And every, if you don't, if you either like or don't like anything, wait a week and it'll change. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, things, first of all, the ESP8266 uh, chip itself is actually this little uh, thingy, and it's a chip. And when we talk about, about them, we usually talk about modules, which are uh, basically cases of these chips, of these chip with, with uh, memory and, and a bit of um, just connecting, like an antenna and whatever. Um, but sorry, so, the, the, the key thing is the antenna and whatever, in that You'll the antenna part of these designs is very, very fussy. You can make your own, but it's very sensitive PC design, very sensitive component design. Um, that, that little bit is very non-trivial. Yeah. Um, so this is what we had last year. Um, so most of the modules we use come from uh, AI, uh, although there are a bunch of manufacturers. Espresso also make uh, a couple of modules. But the esp dash uh, XX are the modules that come from AR, and they are the most common that you'll see um, on the web. And this is the one we dealt with. We dealt with last year, ESP01. Uh, and this is notice how much I'm scrolling. This is what happened in the last year since uh, since we started working with these. Um, and it basically today we're going to talk about the ESP12e, uh, which is uh, the current mainstream uh, version. Although ESP13 is already um, out there in the open, it has uh, uh, mostly just a smaller pitch and like really small size. Um, okay, so things are moving fast. We'll be dealing with ESP12e. Um, this is and it's about like say just under ten dollars. Yeah, so uh, actually six seven dollars even from like Western manufacturers. Um, the dev modules are a bit are a bit uh, more expensive, and I'll talk about them shortly. Um, got a link to the to the actual data sheet if you uh, want it. You also have um, these dev boards, and dev boards are um, kind of nice because they do a lot of a lot of uh, the things around that needs to be done, like having a regulator or a button for reset and button for uh, reprogramming the chip. So. Uh, just nice things to have around them, like auto selection of, of, of copper voltage. Um, so we got a couple of these, the Adafruit, um, I guess it's pronounced Huza, but I really don't know. Um, Haza, 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 okay, yeah. Um, so these are really nice, they have a, a, a regulator that you can basically feed any voltage from uh, 5 to uh, 12 or 13 and it will uh, work nicely. They also have the, um, I don't see it now, I'll add the link. They also have uh, uh, the entire Eagle uh, scheme is, is available in open source so you can build something similar uh, your own. So that's what I have ready right now. Again, these are mostly for evaluation. So at your final project when you want like the um, uh, SMD uh, uh, chip, we have the module separately. Um, okay. Uh, there's also a SparkFun uh, dev board called The Thing, which is extremely uh, popular nowadays. Um, it actually, it's like you can see, they don't actually pack an, an AI uh, module here, they have uh, the raw. Uh, chip here and they build it around it. Okay, so 
the basic connectivity is extremely simple and it's basically connecting uh, VCC and EN, these two pins, to your 3.3 uh, voltage, uh, GND to ground, and TXRX into uh, your board's uh, TXRX. Now, it's a uh, serial RS-232, so like a Bluetooth device, you can either connect it to your own uh, Arduino board, you can connect it to any uh, uh, board you manufactured, you can, create, you can connect it with an FTDI cable directly to your computer. Um, and there are basically two main ways to work with the two main ways to, to work with the um, ESP8266. The first one is the AT command set. You can see that I wrote on my uh, white wall and uh, captured that. Um, so one one way is kind of like the Bluetooth uh, module is to basically have your app communicate via via serial to uh, the ESP8266, and it deals with the entire. Uh, networking, and I think I, I didn't. I, I should have started out by by saying that this thing is amazing, right? Because it has like a, a, a full network stack on it. So imagine your network device on your computer, um, your router, your um, um, a bridge. So to say that in a little more detail, so it's Wi-Fi. Um, it can be a Wi-Fi client where it connects to an access point, um, but it can also be an access point um, that serves other things connecting to it. And then whether it, it's the access point or the client, then it has a whole suite of IP protocols that let you do full internet networking through that connection. Was it designed to make it like anything attached to it could connect to anywhere? Yeah, that's, that's its role in life. Um, so that's a standard way of using it, using it as a, as a uh, specific networking, dedicated networking module, and then have your app running either on uh, your computer or whatever, connect to, uh, connect to that via serial. Um, one of the reasons that everyone in the maker community is very excited about this specific chip is because um, it's uh, very customizable. So you can basically flash your own firmware on it, and I'll go over some technicalities of that, but uh, that's a side note. Mainly, what we'll be doing is using the um, AT commands. And roughly, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> and, and the reason it's a terrible idea is it's easy to do that, but it's also easy to make it work worse. Um, and so, many of the things you'll do will degrade it, its performance. And I think a lot of the interest in hacking it comes from people who don't have easy access to development systems for embedded processing. So in general, I think it's a much better idea to let this just do its job pre-baked and, and you, you program other processors. Yeah, so I warn you in advance, when you're going to go out there to the internet and look for resources about, about this chip, most of what you will see is about how to flash non-standard uh, firmware, firmware on it. Um, I, I kind of, for, for, for this specific class, I wanted to, to show Neil that flashing firmware is, is really cool and nice. And unfortunately, Neil was right. And uh, it looked like, I'm, I'm going to write a separate blog post on it, but it looks like the, uh, the performance of running your own code on it with the Arduino libraries is about three to four times slower than uh, the equivalent AT commands. Um, and I've got a lot more problems with the, in terms of like dropping connections on the non-starter, non-standard AD command set. So I, um, yeah, so for now I think you should focus on that. So let's take a look for a second uh, and see how it works. So I have the PUSA board connected um, and I'm just going to open a serial port uh, and let's play around with this for a second. Um, you can see it? Yeah. And then once again, just belaboring, typing serial commands to it is what your processor will do. The, the role of the computer on the table is your $1 processor typing those commands. Yeah. It, it can be your ATtiny uh, 4484. Uh, and most of us who are a Chrome project, so I like an 8080 uh, 80 8084 connected to it. 
Um, so um, AD reset uh, resets it, which you can also do with the reset pin or in this specific board, the reset button. Um, so it has several uh, work modes in terms of uh, client access point or both. Um, I selected both now, and I should. And, and I, you can actually see that the ESP exposes itself as a um, the SS, as an SSID um, as a network, and I should be able to um, search for networks like you can see. In fact, all the networks around us. Um, and I should also be able to join MIT guest. Supports WPA, WPA2 uh, in terms of encryption. And okay, looks like it's happy. Let's check an IP. And we've got an IP. So I'm not sure how this how good this will work on the uh, on uh, the MIT guest network, but I'll try to open this as a server and let's see if this works. Uh, I'll just curl to it. Well to bring up connection IP. Are you serving for AD? Uh, the CIP server should be by default going on. Oh, uh, ping it. Uh, do a ping to that address. Yeah. I think it answers pings. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, okay. so it's online, um, which is nice. Now, um, so like Neil said, what you will want to do is have your chip or your uh, um, whatever device you're programming connected to it, sending serial commands and reading serial commands. Uh, Output. Um, however, sometimes uh, if you're you want to say well, yeah. So to, for this next part of the discussion, I I didn't really talk about, but just to frame, um, the internet has physical layers. Like we're now using uh, radio at eight hundred two eleven. It has media access that you use to control talking to that. It then has packets that send information, which is universally IP. Um, you can then control the flow of the packets, and there's two protocols for that, TCP and UDP, and then you build applications on top of that. And the thing to belabor is, you c to relate this to the web, you could use this to either open web pages or serve web pages. But if the goal is to talk this over the internet, you can also use this to open sockets, and the socket is what you call sending data through IP packets. And so you can send sockets to and from it, and you don't have to implement a whole web protocol if the goal is just to exchange data. And so in what Tamir is about to talk about, you have to keep track of all the levels of protocol it's implementing. And you can use this at any of those levels. Um, so just a couple of references. Uh, Guy Ziskin last year wrote a small Python uh, program to actually wrap around some of these uh, commands and create, uh, uh, and create a web server. Um, so this is very nice if you're connecting a Raspberry Pi to it or something, um, and just for testing purposes. Um, we ESP is a nice Arduino library, um, which takes care of a lot of the headache of the serial communication. So instead of, uh, instead of actually doing uh, the serial communication, uh, this library exposes a set of, uh, a set of functions uh, that wrap those specific serial calls. So it's a lot easier in terms of um, just sending and, and returning and, and, and understanding when something ends and something begins. Uh, so it's nice. Um, and what happens is once you, I'll just show you this, once you have that library installed in your Arduino, in your Arduino uh, ID, of course this is, a, this is optional, you don't have to use it. Um, you see, you get a very nice set of examples in terms of uh, building a TCP server, UDP, client server, HTTP GET. So all of these things are really nice uh, uh, examples of how to form simple things. 
um, in your Arduino ID. Um, and that's it for the for the, for the AT command set. I wanna I, I really wanted to give you like this uh, this ultimate example that does everything beautifully. But I talked to everyone in this building who's worked with ESP8266. It it doesn't quite exist yet. Yet also like the experiments that I did yesterday and today, the connections dropped only for like one or two percent of. Uh, of, uh, of the connections we created, but still when that happened, it was extremely hard to actually recover from them. Um, so if you think you've got a really nice ESP8266 example, uh, just push it onto this repository. Um, now, custom firmware. So like I said, the promise, and you are not encouraged to do this, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good thing to know. Uh, Adafruit has a, has a really nice uh, has a really nice uh, uh, instruction set on this. But basically, what you can do is you can set the ESP as a as a microcontroller here in your environment. <coughs> and once you do that, you see that you have a, a whole set of examples of ESP, whether it's a web server, Wi-Fi mesh. Uh, lots of interesting, uh, lots of interesting things, including a Wi-Fi access point. Um, and this is plain Arduino code. Okay, so you can program whatever you want onto this, and this, and then put it onto the ESP without any additional uh, microcontrollers. So the promise is really nice. Like I told you, uh, performance is a bit less uh, nice at this time. Um, but it, it became so popular, and another thing that, that's worth mentioning is that you have a lot of GPIO pins with all the latest, uh, with all the latest uh, revisions of this chip. With the AT command set, you can't really uh, use them. With the AT command set, you're limited to serial communication. And the reason why the manufacturers put all these GPIO pins is for your option to put alternative firmware on. Yeah. Um, but again, going back to my intro, the reason why I really don't recommend that is it's it's a dollar to buy a processor full of pins, and you can have a processor talking to pins, doing whatever you want it to do, and then let this poor processor just do protocol, rather than having a processor do protocol plus something else you want it to do. So the the first batch of, of ESP uh, ESPs that we've got here came from Adafruit. Adafruit preloads all the ESP eight two sixty sixes with a node MCU, which is a different firmware than the default firmware. Uh, it's a Lua interpreter that a lot of people in the ESP community uh, tend to like. Um, it's very easy to flash back to um, original firmware. But anyway, instead of putting the, this batch in the, in the shop, I'll put it in my office. So if you come, I'll explain exactly um, how to do it. There's a simple Python code uh, tool called ESP tool to do it. Um, we're supposed to get another batch tomorrow that are pre-flashed with the original firmware, so um, if you wait a couple of days, you can just use that. Um, so, oh yeah, and there's always, there's also an Esprino port, <laughs> and, you know, which is something that uh, we were eager to try in different contexts. Uh, and Esprino is, is, is a fully-fledged uh, JavaScript interpreter that can sit on various types of boards, this one um, as well. With all of that said, we're using the AT firmware. Um, so, just so just numerically, the, you know, ballpark $10, so we can't do one of these per person per week. Um, but if you're eager, you can use it to play with, but, but keep it and use it through the semester. Yeah. Um, so, a bit of it, it, advice from uh, uh, from me. I have been using the uh, this chip for a couple of, of projects, and I think that um, although it has all these uh, amazing capabilities as an access point and as a uh, as a server, I usually prefer to have it as a client working uh, with uh, a cloud server or a cloud service, so that even if connection uh, drops the other clients still have like this server to resort to because if you 
build everything upon this specific uh, this specific chip, then the the other clients or the other parts in your in your network, they're like they're having an issue because they have nothing to connect to. Um, so I I suggest using it as a client and pulling commands from a server rather than uh, pushing. Uh, I think I put some more things here. Oh yeah. Um, so usually we do one of two things with these. We either uh, think of it as like this IoT device that's uh, somewhere uh, in the space and it it's very works very asynchronously. Once in a while, we'll ping a server, checks what happens, and we'll update. Um, another mode of work is if you're actually controlling something um, constantly. So you're having like, uh, for example, a toy car. Uh, and, you're, and you have like this persistent connection with it, you would usually want to keep um, an open TCP connection rather than uh, HTTP requests, so the response time will be a lot faster. Um, I think for, for MTM, I tested that, and for a raw TCP connection, you got less than half a second of uh, response time. Uh, yeah, half a second response time. And for HTTP requests, you can really go for less than a second, a second and a half, which is a lot. That's why it just takes forever. Yeah. Yep. That's it Price for now. Yeah. Um, in terms of speed, what's the most limiting step? Is it the baud rate from the microcontroller to, to, the, to this chip, or is it the connection that this makes with your web server or computer? Or? The serial port is definitely not the baud. It's, it's really stability. I think the biggest issue you're going to run into is not the bit rate, it's variability. It's the stability of the connection. Yeah. So I think like most of the projects you can imagine the scope of, of how to make almost anything, we're not, uh, you know, we're, we're not building a data center or like a high bandwidth, uh, you know, video server or whatever. So uh, the problem is usually how to recover from errors. That's usually uh, the block. The, 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 the blocking, like the blocker here. Um, ESP8266.com is the place to ask uh, questions and to find out that they have a very extensive wiki. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, in the That's back. It. So how do you recover from errors? Is it possible to detect that drop in connectivity and reset the chip with other logic? Or? So, um, you need to do some uh, serial. So first of all, you you can theoretically you can control through the enable pin on the um, on the device the actual is it is it on or is it off, and to build a sophisticated uh, recovery mechanism, I would imagine that you need a proper set of timeouts plus just like uh, power cycling the the chip. That's probably the most robust way. Good, great job getting ready, both both of them ready. I'll send a note to everybody. These can be resources for them. Again, make your processors talk. If you want, you can do this week's assignment also, which is to make two processors talk to each other. And you can use one of these modules as the thing your processor talks to if you're interested. Okay? Good, happy networking.